Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. In the name of God, most compassionate, most forgiving. I would like to extend my thanks, uh, my sincere thanks to the organizers of this wonderful forum and thank them for the kind invitation to me to be able to contribute to this wonderful gathering. Um, I'm very pleased with the theme of this year's forum because from my own context in England, highly secularized Northern European context, uh, we are increasingly seeing evidence that social significance of religion has been recognized. I can only give an example from where I'm currently working at the University of Warwick, uh, a public secular university housing a, a research unit called Warwick Religions and Education Research Unit. And as a Muslim educator, alongside Christian educators and other educators coming from different religious backgrounds, we are reworking out the significance of, of religion in education and in public life. Um, what I would like to share with you in my address are really three points. Um, I want to rehearse or maybe put my own perspective on our current globalized context of cultural religious diversity that is defining our lives and try to discern some challenges that come out of this reality and find out how we can actually respond to these challenges and then move on uh, to focus on much more closely about the core narrative of Islam, the way I see it as a Muslim educator and a theologian. And to ask myself, myself, to what extent Islam is able to reconcile itself within this increasingly pillar secular context. Uh, and that will help me to maybe again discern some principles from my own faith as I see it as resources for being able to relate peacefully and much more meaningfully to one another and offer a log an Islamic logic of, of, of uh, public good and service for the public. And hopefully I will leave you with maybe a message of hope that uh, in fact, um, as people who are coming from different faith traditions, we are able to transcend upon our particularities in the name of embracing the cultural religious diversity that define our world today. So my first point is the reality of cultural and religious diversity. We are living in a world increasingly characterized by cultural and religious diversity. Different value systems based on deeper narratives of meanings formed within distinct historical and cultural contexts are now living by, side by side. It is true that cultural exchange and dialogue have always been a significant part of human story. The evidence for this lie deep in our own identities. Each time we try to pin down what make our identities unique, we find, we find the traces of the other already shaping us, our self-understandings. But today, perhaps the technological innovations are accelerating the speed of these encounters. The increasing diversity while offers opportunities for positive encounters, but also brings together fear of the other, triggering the old prejudices to be remembered, resurfaced, and pushing us back, unfortunately, sometimes to our comfort zones. Therefore, one of the, one of the most significant questions facing the world today, as I see it, is how do we make sense of this difference and cultural and religious plurality defining our lives? Most importantly, how do our faith traditions perceive difference and plurality of cultures? It can be argued that in historical terms, faith traditions became civilizational forces whenever they had the confidence in showing an inclusive attitude towards the other. Diversity became source of creating cosmopolitan faithful polities and faith became a liberating educational force to facilitate human flourishing. And, and showing respect for human dignity and creating a social ethics for the public life where the well-being of the all is protected. In other words, inclusiveness is not really the unique property of the modern secular democracy. Religions do contain within themselves logic of reaching out to the other. And we have examples in history, we don't have time to, to work on that. However, 
When faith is reified into the rigid framework of a religious system, it appears it's no longer able to civilize or facilitate human flourishing, but engage with boundary making and serving the wider political powers. Um, therefore, we have to be realistic in recognizing religion as part of human experience is full of ambiguity and ambivalence. Although religion is supposed to be giving certainty and confidence, we must acknowledge as people who come from different faith traditions that this is also part of faithfulness. Um, however, the rigidity of tribalism, though mostly associated with religions, unfortunately, is not exclusive property of religion itself. For example, secularity, a significant political principle of inclusiveness within liberal democracies, could easily be turned into a dogmatic, rigid position of exclusivity. We can call this secularist or secularism, as different from secularity, which is really meant to be creating space for all to manage their affairs so that they could actually peacefully relate to one another. Um, but today, despite this long history of secularization, secularization in Europe, as we mentioned, the, the religious diversity, it cannot be denied. And we, we now know that because of the globalized context we are living in, migration is one example. It appears that unfortunately, yet again, societies are feeling fragmentation within their own identities. And unfortunately, identity politics, nationalism is making a comeback. We can only just look at the example of Brexit in Britain and its, its consequences. As such, I feel that there is an urgent need to search for a, a, a kind of a new shared social ethics that we could all contribute from our traditions, religious or none, so that we could actually be able to relate one another peacefully, and most crucially, a social ethics that could rebuild trust among ourselves. Uh, without creating this feeling of trust, it is impossible to be able to attend to each other's grievances or injustices or inequalities. The first de facto reality is we have to rebuild the trust. And religions should be able to offer a logic of reconciliation in this sense. So faith traditions can significantly contribute to the emergency of this new sense of shared social ethics, essential for us to be able to meaningfully address the challenges facing us all. Yet again, we have to be realistic and, and balanced in recognizing the history of conflict and suspicion in forming our own religious memories. Imperialist theologies have shaped our collective identities. We have to confront with the fact that our faith has always been associated with the imperial powers. I see the only way forward from this is not to be imprisoned with these imperialistic faith constructions identities, is to be willing to rethink our faith in our new context. The concept of rethinking is essential because it means we are able to, in a sense, critically engage with our tradition while embrace its core values, but also be prepared to say, yes, there are X, Y, Z, right or wrongs. So this rethinking is an essential part of maintaining a new language of better relating to one another if those who are contributing to this space are all willing to do that. It is not only a duty from the religious people to do that, in my view. The secular humanism, has time has arrived to be able to say, yes, it has its own limitations now. I can only give one example. Obviously, I come from Islamic tradition. I can say that Islam in Europe today is a challenge. Islam needs to rethink urgently. And in fact, because we haven't done this as Muslim faith leaders, we are really, unfortunately, implied with so much violence and, of course, so much prejudice that goes in our faith, uh, in, in the name of our faith. Um, but this rethinking also should be exercised with secular, inclusive secular a democracy in many ways, and it is core values. As such, Islam presents a challenge to European secularity. Therefore, I am very interested in this new language of making religions as part and parcel of social space, of policy making, of being able to define with one another. So while Islam has a lot to do to work out, but also Islam is a challenge to the secular democratic European context. They need to find a way of in a humane way, include Islam's within the narrative of New Europe. Now, here comes the preaching. 
Now, as a Muslim theologian, when I began to think and rethink, what is the core Islamic narrative? I have to be honest and share what I believe as a Muslim. I don't want to claim that I'm representing all Muslims. I'm not kind of the envoy of a Muslim ummah sent from a caliph somewhere. But I'm just suggesting that as a Muslim theologian, if I reflect on what is the core message, core narrative of Islam, this is what I have to share and I discern. First of all, I look at the core Islamic sources, the Quran and prophetic tradition. What do I find there? The Quran, it pains to describe that what it wants from humanity is simply this. God creates humanity with the gift of life. Because God gives his gift to humanity, God demands recognition from humanity. Therefore, immediately the entire religious language of the Quran is actually informed by a deeper ethical language. So faithfulness is, is, is a way of being able to say thank you to God and recognize that. This very crucial point, Islam is really a, probably a religion of rights. Because if you look at the Quran, Quranic context composition, it will talk about what God deserves his rights because there's a justification for it. He gave life. But what is actually human rights? The Quran de depicts in, in detail. And Islamic law has elaborated on this in, in detail. But essentially, uh, the Quran acknowledges that there will be diversity, a difference. So how does the Quran actually uh, define the category of being, human being, within the context and possibility of different expressions of being human? Well, the answer of the Quran is very simple. The very famous verse says, we have created you in one essence as men, women, as people of different languages and tribes, in fact, even religions, according to some commentators, so that, the Quran says, you should be able to have the opportunity of learning from one another. The Quranic concept is ta'aruf. It is very interesting that the Quranic intervention to human history is, couched, is, is, is kind of put into an, a transformative educational language. Diversity is there in principle not to invoke suspicion, but actually to be seen as creativity of the creator. So therefore, today we have to invoke this theological concept in order to allow that Islam is able to embrace diversity because it is um, within the Quranic deep narrative that we have to acknowledge the difference and diversity. Now, we will have, of course, diversity of theological disputes. Yes, nobody can deny this. But the whole point is faith is depicted as human competence be, to be able to transcend one's own selfish world and be open to the other and to the divine. Essentially, there will be some differences the Quran acknowledges that they will be never be addressed properly. Theological differences the Quran would finally put to the polemics that taken place in Prophet's lifetime, peace be upon him, saying that, look, oh Muhammad, there is no point in trying to convince and convert one another. You are not going to change each, each other. But these theological differences should be left to God to decide in the hereafter. But in this world, most importantly, you should be able to cooperate and serve common good. And the Quran would insist upon uh, achieving uh, equality and balance in, in, in our lives. And therefore, of course, respecting our dignity. And, uh, and therefore, justice becomes a cornerstone, uh, basically, in Islamic story. In fact, the Quran would say the entire office of prophecy is established because God wants the prophets, through prophets, humanity have a chance to establish justice. This is a single verse in the Quran which puts end to the entire prophetic tradition, in a sense, in a one kind of stroke, saying that prophecy is there to achieve justice. And you have to build, establish this justice. And it's a struggle, of course. Um, now, essentially, um, this is the definition of the faithful according to the, according to the Quranic framework. And we can see linguistically this makes sense because the Quran will define so-called the infidels, which is a limited term in English, doesn't really cover. The Quranic concept of kafir or kuffar, the famous concept, doesn't at all refer to theological content. It really refers to the state of being in ungrateful state, not acknowledging God's favors upon you. So therefore, the essential point here is that the, the, the religious vocabulary of, of Islam it's actually embedded with a deeper ethical reality. And we have to rework out that to make that as a resource for us today when we talk about how Islam could reconcile itself with diversity around it. Um, and that brings me to uh, my really final point.
There are examples I don't think I have time to go into in, in detail, uh, and our chairman is already working through his warnings. Uh, I, I, can only give, I, can only give, <laughs> I can only give one example, is the fact that the idea of common good and public service is so essential to public ethics uh, in Islamic self-understanding that we have principles enshrined within Islamic law. For example, Islamic law says that uh, actually public good or serving public good should be a source of sharia, maslaha in Arabic, is recognized within all uh, uh, legal schools of thought in Islam to be a source, an independent source of lawmaking, sharia making in many ways. So we've got the prophetic uh, tradition, we've got the Quran, but also we've got uh, public good to be able to function as a source of lawmaking. In other words, there's a deep trust in Islam that humanity, despite all of its limitations, is able to find out meaningful ways of agreeing on a common strategy to, to obviously serve the good for all and to address in injustices, whatever they are. And there's a very famous prophetic tradition that says there is no giving of harm or receiving of harm. Based on this single statement, we have a medieval Muslim scholar called Najmuddin al-Tufi. He writes a commentary, which really is basically, when you read it, is actually social ethics in Islam in, in medieval times. Essentially says, in public affairs, there should be right for humanity to be able to sometimes even limit some of the verses in the Quran. Because in, in human affairs, in, in interpersonal affairs, what is crucial is not really simply what God demands, but what can achieve justice on earth. And I feel this is a brilliant, again, resource within Islam that we should be able to dip into it and use today as a resource for us to meaningfully relate, contribute to a possible new social ethics that could enable a new conversation for all of us. Now, my final point is pedagogic and educational in nature. The idea is, uh, Fates, in my view, when they are most really good, when they are turned into a liberating, transformative educational visions. And I do believe that the entire interventions of God's intervention in human history are, are meant to be transformative educational experiences so that humanity could actually grow into humanity and, and obviously express its, its creativity in, in different levels. Education is so essential, therefore, to be able to put forward this uh, a vision that I think in Islam is embedded in its own self-understanding. And my final point is, often people assume that Islam is so radically emphasized on the otherness of the God, it denies the imminence, the, the, the kind of inner dwelling of God's presence. That is, in a sense, is unfortunate because the word Tawheed, which is oneness of God, is very true. God gives gift of life, deserve recognition, therefore we have to serve him alone. Makes sense. But Tawheed also means unity, to be able to find unify contingency of life in a pattern of meaning that actually could guide us. So Tawheed is not only simply radical transcendence of the other, but also it is, it is kind of an attempt of bring about a meaningful narrative within the contingency diversity of life. And I believe that through education today, we mostly need to offer our young people skills, resources, competences for intercultural understanding, inter-religious understanding, so that they will be able to put their own faith heritage in a context. In, in other words, they will be able to learn how to recognize the value, virtue of self-relativization. I heard a concept this morning, the act of self-relativization or putting oneself into a context is crucial in political societies. So not because we simply retreat back into our tribalistic uh, ideas. Actually, it means to acknowledge that obviously life is bigger than us. So the act of being able to self-relativize, put yourself into a relativity of a context. Here, relativism doesn't mean philosophical relativism. It means to make your act relative to your context, basically. And then you're able to listen to the other, reach out to the other. Otherwise, we will always show, of course, the violence of reducing, assimilating other to our own categories. Now, education is, is, is my final point, and I'm immediately going to start, stop, is there is a great hope that through our own educational, public educational system, we have to create, in my view, non-confessional uh, religious education opportunities where religions can be used as an educational source. And both people of children of religion and people who come from no religious backgrounds recognize the significance of religious literacy today. And that should enhance the kind of religious nurture takes place 
within the context of a mosque or a church or a religious context. I think in Europe, particularly in the context of Europe, in fact, worldwide, we have to cooperate to bring about this educational competence building uh, quickly in order to be able to respond to challenges surrounding us. With this uh, final word, I would like to um, uh, finish my presentation and by simply reading this final sentence, if the chair allows me. Perhaps more than ever, we need to draw on the transformative educational vision of Islam so that it is humanizing vision of upholding justice, protecting the dignity and the welfare of all can become apparent. May peace be upon you all. Thank you very much.